Candidates, some simple rules. Candidates have a minute and a half to introduce yourselves. Panelists have 30 seconds to ask you questions. I give them certain liberties because it's important that they get the answers right. Uh, candidates are allowed one minute to answer those questions. I pretty much stick to that when there's, such a, when there's a handful of candidates. When I cut you off, I don't mean to be rude. I'm just trying to keep the timeline. Um, panel members are allowed to ask one question only. They can ask you individually. They can ask you all together. Um, they prefer a yes or no answer, but that's not how sometimes the questions come out. So I will allow uh, 30 seconds most of the time to respond. Um, this is uh, this is not a forum to air personal grievances. Panel members, of course, will keep their questions as generic as possible. Candidates will not mention other candidates in their responses. And again, just a reminder to the panel that as current uh, sitting judges, uh, no discussion or questions about current cases will be allowed. That being said, um, who's up first? Mr. Pollock, would you like to introduce yourself? You have a minute now. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I'd like to thank Veterans in Politics for hosting this event. Thank the panelists for their time in asking being here and asking some questions, and to our audience and people at home, thank you for listening in. I'd also like to thank our service members for having served our wonderful country. My name is Judge Ken Pollock. I'm currently serving in Department J of the 8th Judicial District Court. Um, a little bit about myself, I graduated from the University of California, San Diego, went on to the University of San Diego Law School. I was admitted to practice law in 1991 and elected to the bench in 2008. I currently serve in the family division. <coughs> I also am one of two judges that hear probate cases for the 8th Judicial District. Um, in terms of my personal life, I believe in community service. I serve on the Board of Trustees for ch the Children's Speedway Charities as well as the Clark County Law Library. And I look forward to your questions. And also, I'd like to thank Veterans in Politics for your support in my last election, and I'd like to ask for your support again. Thank you, Mr. Perez. A minute and a half. Uh, first of all, I'd also like to thank the Veterans in Politics, and, and I thank you all of the uh, board members who will be asking questions this afternoon. Uh, my name is Roman Perez, and I am running for Family Court Department J. And uh, a little bit about myself. I did graduate from the University of Texas at Austin, and you might see my campaign material orange. That's no coincidence. <laughs> I uh, have moved here in, uh, to Las Vegas back in 2003 and lived here in Nevada by choice for about 10 years now. Just recently uh, celebrated my 10th year anniversary with my wife. I have a six and eight year old, uh, six year old boy, eight year old daughter, and so uh, they keep me really busy. I've been practicing family law, uh, focused primarily in family law for 15 years now. And in those 15 years, my clients have their needs have grown. And as those needs have grown, I have been able to grow with them. Those families run into problems with the criminal courts. They run into problems with the probate courts. They run into problems with personal injury. I've been able to help those families in all of their issues. And I think it's important to have a broad base, not just in family law, but in other areas of law, because ultimately family court is about people and about families. And I'd appreciate your support. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Ms. Hughes. Ms. Hughes. Sorry. Okay. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Rena Hughes. I came to Las Vegas in 1989 after graduating from the University of Oklahoma in 1988 where I went to law school. I come from a military family. My father and my brother are both veterans. My brother is a disabled veteran from the Iraqi war. I believe in community service and I have served our community in many, many aspects. Um, as far as my legal background, I am a pro tem judge in family court, a settlement hearing master in family court. I served as an arbitrator for the state bar fee dispute committee and I also chaired that panel for many years, about 13 years total. And I've dedicated myself to family law for 24 years. I am one of 32 in this state um, certified family law specialists, having been certified by the Nevada State Bar in that area. And I believe in restoring the public's confidence to family court. That's my main <coughs> mission, and that's why I'm running for Department J. Thank you. Thank you very much. All of you very timely. Our first question will be to you, Ms. Hughes, from uh, Ms. Ms. Naharis uh, on the end there. Okay. Um, this is for the incumbent judge. Oh, sorry. 
Um, <laughs> I, I got my stuff set ready to go. Sorry. Okay, in my opinion, I have seen mothers that have multiple children with multiple different fathers and tend to abuse, the, in my opinion, the child support system and don't want to work or choose not to work even though they may have the education or the capability. Since there's a review in child support, I believe it's every two years or two, three years, do you take that into consideration in regards to just simply meeting the economic standards of the father or who, who is paying, or do you do anything to say, gee, what are you doing to better yourself, therefore better your life for your children, instead of just being dependent on the child support? Mr. Ball, one minute, please. Child support is governed by statutes 125B 070080. And the first question that you have to look at is, what is the custodial arrangement? Because that will determine which formula you use. The legislature has set forth the formulas for us to use. But in a joint custody situation, certainly the income of the mother is relevant. And I do look for uh, the mother, actually both parents to be working. And I'm equally uh, rigid on both parents that they're doing their best to support their children. Thank you. Ms. Wick? Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about education. Each candidate can. First, Is are you for all or one? They can all. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to know if you're familiar with the Common Core curriculum that we're recently uh, implementing in Nevada. And two, even though this is supposed to be a nonpartisan race, I believe everybody does have their own individual philosophy on education. And I'd just kind of like to ask you what you think is the best Ms. education Hughes. system. Ms. Hughes, 30 seconds, please. Okay. Um, you know, I've talked to some teachers about the Common Core curriculum. It's my understanding that each school district um, is able to select or reject, and that the Clark County School District actually did implement the Common Core and they have some issues and some problems with that. Um, as a judge, you know, I, I wouldn't make those decisions. I wouldn't make that determination. Um, but I believe that if people are upset or don't like a system, that they should get together and talk about those issues Thank and you. try to resolve them. Thank you, Mr. Fred. 30 seconds. I, I have uh, been, a, been listening to the Common Core issues. I, I understand what they are. And I think it's very important to to make sure that you go from school to school, you're teaching the same things, and people are understanding at the same levels. Now, that being said, that's that's not really anything that would come before us as, as family board judges. However, I, I'm so adamant that education is freedom. Education is so important to, to children, and, and when we talk to children through either the payback uh, program through CCSD. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Can I just clarify my question really was, I understand you don't control the curriculum. But in a custody battle where one is wanting to homeschool for say because they don't like Common Core or that type of thing, how are you, you know, personally, how are you going to come down on that? First, you'd have probably have to know each each one of the backgrounds of those education. But that's my question. What is what is your preferred um, educational standard? Fifteen seconds, Ms. Hughes. Okay. I, yeah, I, I didn't realize that that was your question: homeschooling versus public schooling. Um, you do have to treat each situation individually and look at the level that the children are at and who is going to be homeschooling and if they're qualified to do that. So each family is different and they have different needs. So I would treat each case on an individual Thank you. basis. Mr. Perez, 15 seconds. And, and I agree. The uh, homeschooling would have to be taught by someone who's, who's able to homeschool. There is a, a, a program through CCSD that would allow for a certain uh, core program to be taught. So they, that has to be followed. And if that's being followed and all things are equal, then the decision would be made on the family. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Pollock. 45 seconds, please. OK, well, to start with, I believe that education needs to be evidence-based uh, and that we need to do our best to prepare our children for their futures. In, between, in the discussion of homeschooling versus public schooling, the primary decision-making is on the part of the parents. To the extent that they agree, I don't need to get involved. If they don't agree, what I'm going to be looking at, and I regularly look at, is what is the plan that each parent is pro uh, providing, what they're proposing, and which one is going to ultimately be best for the child. And that's case by case, and it's fact specific, and what can they offer me in terms of what is their plan. Thank you. Dr. Hawkins, next question, please. This question is for Ms. Hughes and Mr. Perez. Uh, historically, in this county, 
challenges to sitting judges are unsuccessful unless there is a problem, in which case the bar typically lines up behind a candidate. Do you see this election as one in which there is a problem, and if so, what is it? Or do you view yourself as simply the better candidate for this position? Mr. Perez, one minute, please. Thank you. I see that this is a, a better candidate. It's not necessarily running against Judge Pollack, but I believe that family court is more than just intellect. It's more than just the understanding of the law. It's about temperament. It's about families, and it's about understanding what the families, what the issues are that the families come into my courtroom with. And I, that is something that I believe I bring to the table, that I would be a better candidate, a better judge, in understanding, having dealt with families in all of their different kinds of issues, and then dealing with them on a family-by-family -family basis. Thank you. Ms. Hughes, Ms. Hughes, one minute, please. I am running in this department because I believe I'm the most qualified person to be a judge in this department. I believe the public has lost confidence in this particular court and that there needs to be a restoration of that confidence. I think it's all evidence through the Review Journal uh, Judicial Survey. Thank you. Mr. Jonas, next question. Okay, my question is in similar, uh, similar line. Uh, this is for the two opponents. Uh, in, in any race, whether it's judicial or whether it's uh, legislative or whatever the case may be, there's overwhelming advantage to the incumbent. Okay, so what do you two as opponents see that you could do differently to help change that? Or do you think it's something that fundamentally should be changed within the voting system itself Ms. to Hughes. give people a better advantage against the government? I'm not Ms. sure which question Ms. to answer. Ms. Hughes, 30 seconds. Okay, I'm not sure which question to answer. Uh, do I want to change the voting system? Do I, I disagree that the incumbent has an overwhelming advantage or I wouldn't be running? I know that I'm the better qualified candidate and I get my message out to the public, I think they will see that. Thank you. And Mr. Perez, 30 seconds. I, I don't disagree that the incumbent has an advantage. However, I think that it's important that we get out the message that it's about fairness. It's about a judge who's willing to listen to listen to the litigants, listen to the people who are talking to you, and not only not only hear them, but to actually listen and give a fair decision in a timely manner. That's important to the people of our county. Thank you very much. Dr. Dupre, next question, please. Yeah, for all uh, can candidates and judge, what are your views on parental alienation? Your views on parental alienation? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pollock, uh, 30 seconds, please. Well, it's abhorrent and should not be tolerated. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Perez, 30 seconds. I agree. No, uh, the, uh, it's in, I see it a lot in my cases where parents come in and want to say that, oh, I, I haven't seen the child in three weeks, and then the, the evidence parents out differently. So I think the judge needs to listen not only to whatever the allegations are between the two, but actually see evidence. You cannot have a parent alienating a, a child from another a parent because a, a child needs both parents when they're both available. Very good. And Ms. Hughes. I have seen it occur, and what I have seen in those instances is some psychological dysfunction as the basis for that. And I would definitely recommend that there is therapy in those situations and reunification, and if the parental alienation continues, even a change in custody. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Judge Bob Newman, next question, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, I will not be voting uh, the group on the endorsement. Or nor will I be in the discussions on it, so, uh, because I don't know everybody here. Uh, my question is very simple. We know that there's no more room in the courthouses to add more judges and no money in the budget to keep funding judges year after year like we have for the past 40 years. What would you propose to do? How would you restructure family court to increase the uh, delivery of uh, resolution services to the public given that we have so many pro se litigants and you know, people who can't afford a whole lot of litigation. How would you change family court to, you know, to accommodate the, those changes in our systems? And yeah, we're doing pretty well on time. I will give each of you one minute to respond. Ms. Hughes will start on your end. Thank you. Um, I realize there's about 61 to 62% of the litigants are without counsel. And I wouldn't restructure the entire family court system. I don't think that that's necessary, but I do 
promote outsource mediation. I am on the outsource mediation committee at Family Court. I also serve as a mediator free of charge. I think that the pro bono litigants, um, they don't have enough for an attorney. They get bogged down in the system. They need some outside help, and the courts can't always handle that. Um, I would promote outsourced mediation to have them resolve their issues. Thank you. Mr. Perez, your response, one minute, please. Thank you. I, you know what, I've talked about a little bit with some people about perhaps setting up a, a pro per, a pro se court, someone to handle just pro se people. And, and that may work in, the, the downside is you've got people who hire lawyers in the middle of cases and, and they come in, but for the most part, you have a lot of lawyers sitting with clients who are paying, who are paying for these lawyers to sit there while we're listening to pro se uh, individuals talking about pretty much anything they want to talk about. And I think that if we were to have, or at least consider a pro per or pro se court, where those people would go into, uh, into it with, a, with a, a judge who could give them a little bit of time to, to go this, but actually narrow down the focus of the issues, perhaps that may be a way to take away those types of cases from the judges who can hear the judges who have the, the cases that have attorneys. I also think 16.2 is very important. You've got to get the, you've got to force the attorneys to contact each other before they get to the case Thank management you, Mr. conference. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Very much. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, the panel may remember in 2008 I ran saying the family court was broken. For the last five years, I've been trying to fix it. And one of the reasons that the review journal survey is what it is because I hold the parties and especially the lawyers' feet to the fire, make them follow the rules. I also am a big proponent of our mediation programs. Um, I don't allow parties to go forward with motions until they attend family mediation to see if they can resolve their own parenting issues. Um, I'm also very aggressive in my case management style, and as a result, I've reduced my caseload by over 60% in the last five years. That's despite receiving over 100 cases a month as new cases. So I don't know that we necessarily need to develop new services. We need to use the tools that we have and hold the lawyers and the parties' feet to the fire and hold them accountable. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your responses. And Mr. Lamb, you are next. Question. The candidates, uh, this may or may not be under your jurisdiction, but what I would like to talk about for just a second is to the extent that you believe or not believe that parents are fiduciarily responsible for the actions of their children, especially when those children have committed a felony or a misdemeanor crime where damages have been incurred. Are the parents responsible for those damages? And if not, would you change that? And we'll start with you, Mr. Pollock. Uh, Thinking about that. things like graffiti or vandalism. Well, and it depends whether you're asking in terms of are they responsible for the criminal penalties or not when we're dealing with juveniles, the penalties of the juvenile delinquency statute, or if you're talking about civil damages, because by statute there are certain liabilities of a parent for the acts of their child. What's your opinion on that? I think parents, to the victim of the act, does have a responsibility in terms of the sanction from the state to the juvenile. They should not be paying the fine of the child. The child should be doing the community service and paying the restitution back to the community. Very good. Mr. Brett? I actually handle several juvenile justice matters as part of my camp on Facebook. And I, my understanding is that we do juvenile justice for rehabilitation of these kids. These kids need to be put back on the right track before they go into the adult system. And making parents responsible for those kids civilly through the making the penalties, absolutely, you, 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 because parents are ultimately responsible for their children. Now, those children also need to earn it. Now, if, they, if there are penalties or, or certain therapies or classes or things that need to be done through the juvenile justice system, those children need to be need to be held to the, to the uh, accountable for what they've done. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with everything that Mr. Perez said, and I believe in a mentoring program, but ultimately the parents are responsible for their children, and I would have pulled the law if that kids were in front of me, but I believe that they're equally responsible. I don't believe that the parents are the scapegoat, but ultimately, they're the ones who need to be supervising their children. And if they need help, they need to seek those social programs, big brother, big sister. If they're working too much, have someone there who is a mentor to those children. 
but they're equally responsible. Yeah, you guys are great. We've had some long-winded candidates, and you guys are just right on the money. <laughs> so thank you. Mr. Melendrez, your, your question to the candidates. I, I have a question from uh, Ms. Hughes. You said that you feel that the uh, public's lost confidence in, in the family court. Um, why do you think that is, and how are you going to fix it specifically? Yeah, one minute. Um, I believe that because I've seen the survey in the Review Journal where 60% of the attorneys that appear in this court have um, voted not to retain this judge. 59% approximately say that the rulings are without adequate basis and 56% say that the rule of law is not followed adequately. Um, the judges are subject to review and it's an anonymous review. So I believe that the public and the peremptory challenges as well, the clients pay $450 not to have their case heard in this department. And he's one of the top people that are peremptory challenged. So that's what I mean about the public um, in general having lost confidence. And I think I'm out of time or I would tell you what I would do. You actually had 12 seconds left. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've been AD rated by my peers and by the judges in this community, which is the highest legal standard that you can achieve. And so I believe there's much confidence in my legal knowledge and my legal abilities. And you're good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blanchard will ask the last and final question of the candidates. Uh, you will each have one minute to respond. First of all, I want to thank all of you for uh, showing up and running. It's when you know what you know, you don't really want to necessarily run again, but thank you for running. And for those that are running for the first time, congratulations. I know it's a tough road to hoe. Um, I just want to ask one quick quality that you each um, attain that makes you or sets you apart from your challengers or the incumbent. Mr. Paul. Okay. Well, in, in one word, experience, but that is too simple. I've got the greatest depth and breadth of experience of any of the candidates. I'm the only one who's actually served as a judge, and I'd, I'd like to address the RJ survey. What's interesting is, number one, it's an anonymous survey that 115 lawyers out of 4,800 respond to. And when you read the RJ article, even the RJ reporter acknowledged that the criticism of me was that I'm too strict about enforcing the rules. So do lawyers not like me because I hold them accountable? Yes. Do lawyers not like me because I don't award them attorney fees when they try to have special rules to get judgments against their clients? Yes. I think lawyers should follow the same rules as every other member of society. Now getting back to my experience, uh, in the last five years I've presided over 1,200 trials, over 6,200 motions. I have a very low reversal rate in front of the Nevada Supreme Court. Cases have been brought before them and I've been affirmed. Thank you. Perfect timing. Mr. Perez, one minute. In a word, I would say temperament. Temperament is, is the ability to make somebody feel like, hey, I got heard. People, this judge understood me. This person's understanding where I'm coming from. And it's not just coming from, from the family law uh, aspect. It's coming from issues that families face. I'm, I'm a family man, and I understand what it is to be in a family, part of a family. I'm also a businessman, so I understand what it takes to build and then have to take apart these businesses in a divorce. This is the experience that, that the family court needs, true life experience. And I think it's very important to have somebody on there who people can say, hey, you know what? He's been through it. He knows what this is about. He knows what I'm going through, and I'm OK. Thank you. And Ms. Hughes, one minute. Thank you. Um, I would say it's my experience and my qualifications. For 24 years, I've dedicated my practice to family law. I'm a state specialist in family law. I'm a pro tem judge, a settlement hearing master, and I bring compassion to the bench. I don't see things as simply black and white. I've heard every scenario under the sun of the thousands of clients that I've represented. And yes, I will enforce the rules, but not to the detriment of the families that are appearing in front of me. I don't have that disconnect. I have the compassion and the integrity to deal with their problems on a reasonable basis and not to cut them off and simply shoo them out of my courtroom without giving them a good analysis and a reasoned decision. And that's what I will bring to the bench. Thank you very much. Um, panelists and audience, please give Ken Pollock, Rita Hughes, and Romeo Perez a round of applause. Now, I know Ben.
veterans of politics would like photographs of you guys, so if you'd follow Karen over there, she will uh, 